My husband, Dmitry Fyodorovich Verbitsky, while living in Mankovka, was the director of the Mankova Kalitvinsk Technical School and was accused of allowing the children of clergy and of the kulaks to enroll into his school without permission from the authorities. Moreover, he was put under house arrest until further notice. Since there were no guards assigned to watch my husband, he took advantage of the situation by jumping out of the window and escaping. When word spread my husband had fled, the village council took me and my children, one of whom was only two months old, to the railway station and bought us tickets to Mariupol, where my widowed father was living. As my husband and I had earlier agreed, I was to go to my father's and wait there for further instructions. After some time, I received a letter from him stating that he had found work as an inspector at the grain elevator in Piriprava and that we should join him. Piriprava is in the Kuban region of the USSR on the shore of the Azov Sea, 40 kilometers from the city of Yeisk. It is a small fishing village located around a group of grain elevators. My husband had found an abandoned cottage and fixed it up for our arrival. We decided to wait there until everything calmed down. Perhaps with time they would forget about us. So far we had been lucky. The city was beginning to experience unemployment. However, since my husband was unable to find work, we decided to move on to Mariupol. Because of the high unemployment, no one had money. We found ourselves spending the last of our rubles on looking toward an uncertain future. While searching long and hard for work in Mariupol, my husband registered at the unemployment office as required. Almost immediately he was arrested. Mariupol was the main city of our region and our office was considered the regional one. The city councils that belonged to our office were called the periphery. All the farmers living on the periphery, whether they owned livestock or not, were expected to contribute a precise amount of meat to the government agency. For the first time in my life, I actually saw a cow cry. An elderly couple was ordered to give up their cow to the state. We cried the whole way, the old man said. My wife was hugging and stroking her Mashka, and Mashka seemed to understand where she was being taken. You see, she's still crying, and sure enough I could see tears coming from the eyes of the cow. Most of the burden of providing for the family fell on the backs of women. They worked in the factories and offices and obtained and prepared food and clothing. Although burdened by their responsibility for raising a family, we women somehow adapted and learned to live one day at a time. Sometimes we would get to play cards or dominoes, or just fool around and perhaps sing some songs in harmony. My husband returned after serving his six-year sentence. He returned to find himself again without work, under the surveillance of NKVD and without friends. All friends had also been arrested while others were too afraid to continue a friendship. He did manage to find someone, but sometimes he would come home tipsy from drinking. And that is how it continued until the catastrophe, which destroyed our family completely. The state moved over 50 homeless teenagers into our building. My kitchen suddenly became communal property. At first, we didn't hit it off too well. Find a book and read something to them, my husband suggested. 
To ensure grabbing their attention, I selected for them the seven who were hanged by Andreev. Walking to the kitchen, I said, Well, kids, I would like to read to you a little. A few grumbled, Go ahead, read, while the others were hostile and silent. Initially, they didn't appear interested. Patiently, I kept reading. I couldn't finish the book that evening, but when I turned to leave, some of them wanted to know when I would return so that they could find out what happened. The following evening they came around again to sit and listen, even shushing those who were making noise. The Germans tore Poland to pieces in a few days descending on the country like an evil hurricane. Nor was Russia spared the fate of Poland. The German vultures swept down on the Russian soil, crumbling and burying everything in their path and bringing death. With the war came the flood of refugees. As soon as the first bomb was dropped on Poland, bread and all other products disappeared from the market. To receive a quarter of a pound of margarine, I stood in a line with 7,000 people, and behind me there were at least as many. We stood day and night and got nothing. Our city was soon surrounded by the Germans. Twenty or so soldiers ran down our street, and everything grew quiet. The troops finally passed by. The shooting ceased. People began walking up and down the street. My daughter ran up to me. Mommy, the girls are going to look in on the stores. Maybe there is some bread left. Can I go? Go ahead, but come right back. The store was around the corner. Just as they turned the corner, I saw them running back. Mommy, there is a German soldier on a bicycle. It was a motorcycle. This was a sign that the Germans took the city without a battle. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief. Up to now, the Jews had been left alone and walked about freely, although the authorities were keeping track of them. On a certain day, old man, Gorlin, who had been a neighbor, came knocking on my door and informed us that the Germans had ordered the Jews to pack up their belongings and prepare to leave. By evening of the same day, we watched as they were led down the street toward the military barracks outside of the city. By the time we ran outside, the first column had already passed the house. In front were the rabbis, the doctors and their families, and the Jewish intelligentsia. Next were the elderly, supported under the arms. The sick were on stretchers, and the children walked along, carrying knapsacks and small bundles. The procession moved very slowly. It was surprising that people didn't attempt to leave while they had the chance. The refugees, who were referred to as Polacks, were actually Polish Jews. They knew all about the ghettos and the various incidents of persecution, but they refused to believe what they were being told. One Jewish acquaintance told me, Why should we leave? We are not some kind of rich folks. We've walked all of our lives we sent our daughter away, but we are not going. All of my co-workers did the same, remaining for fear of losing their jobs. It was difficult to believe that they would shoot down 7,500 people for no reason. But several days later, they were executed and buried in trenches that we had dug around the city before the Germans arrived. A vile, inhuman, and criminal act had taken place in history. 
Several people died in our building. The Jews had been killed, and the yard became empty. My children and I were sent to Germany. At the Mariupol station, we said goodbye to everything that had been dear to us. And we said goodbye forever. The railway car was filled to the limit, and the doors were bolted shut with a padlock. One of the men in the prison was a German soldier, a deserter. He had been arrested because he went home to visit his sick wife and children without permission. He told us about the battle at Stalingrad and the German defeat on all of the fronts, the armies destroyed and retreating. He said that half of Germany was already in American hands. We listened in amazement, not believing our ears, but saying nothing. We didn't want to miss a single word of his account. Throughout our entire four-year imprisonment, we had not known what was happening on the military front. We stood for hours in the hallway with the other prisoners, talking without being told to return to our cells.